So our story for today starts all the way back in the 19th century uh, where we look at the rise of Zionism. Now, of course, many Jews had wanted to return to the land of Zion and Jerusalem, as had been said in the, the Hatikva, which is now uh, the uh, Israeli national anthem. So people, ever since like, the exile uh, by the Romans, all the way back in 135 AD, they've always wanted to return back to the land of Israel. However, this was only a small trickle up until the rise of this Zionist movement. And then fast forward now to uh, the end of World War I, and you end up having the Balfour Declaration. And within this Balfour Declaration, it declared that there was going to be a homeland for both the Jews and a homeland for the Arabs, which would respect uh, both religious groups and respect both ethnic groups within that, that region, right? So that was the kind of foundations of what uh, the British mandate in Palestine was going to be about. So during this time, this is when you start to have a big influx of uh, Jewish uh, migrants from like Europe and from America and many other places yeah, to the land that would become Israel. However, there ended up being a huge backlash against this because much in the same way that you saw within many places in Europe uh, during the 50s and 60s and stuff, people were very strongly opposed to mass migration and stuff, right? And this obviously got very, very nasty at times. Um, and it's understandable from our perspective because they're like, hold on, all these people coming in, they're buying land off of these uh, absentee uh, uh, Turkish landlords and stuff. They're kind of moving into neighborhoods. There's so many of them that they're kind of swamping their neighborhoods so that they no longer look the same as they did before. So we're going to really oppose this. They end up being uh, riots against them. They end up being pogroms against them. And eventually the British were like, okay, right, we're, we're not going to have any more uh, migration coming in. Right? So they paused migration. And this was just before the Holocaust. So during the Holocaust, the Jews weren't able to just mass migrate to Palestine. However, after the Holocaust, this is when you had lots of Jews being like, no, this is evidence that we need a homeland, right? And so more and more of them came, despite what the British authorities uh, wanted to do, and end up being terrorist actions by the Ogun and the Stern Gang against the British authorities, most notably with the terror attack on the King David Hotel in uh, 1946, I believe. So eventually in 1948, the British withdraw ends up being a UN declaration and the land is split between the Jews and the Arabs. So this is the formation of the creation of the state of Israel. However, as soon as this was done, all of the neighboring Arab states decided that they were going to descend on Israel to snuff it out in its cradle and to make sure that Israel was wiped off of the map and that the Jews would be driven back into the sea. However, in spite of all this year, despite not having support from the British, Americans or from the French, the Israelis fought off all the Arab armies, and this was the first war for Israel's very survival year, the first war of free. And Israel ended up winning, and this is where you end up eventually having the 1949 borders. Although, that's a bit of a misnomer, because in 1949, this was merely an armistice line. There were no actual borders because no Arab state recognised the existence of Israel. So you can't have borders with a place that doesn't exist in your eyes, right? So this is just where the Israeli forces were able to hold the line. And this is the, where the kind of like borders of Israel in, in a way kind of uh, have been declared as being. Now I should also include the fact that during this time, this is where you had the Nakba. So in Arabic, this is like the disaster or the catastrophe. And what this basically was, was 700,000 uh, Arabs either forcibly being expelled or feeling that they wanted to flee and stuff yeah, from the Israelis. And this led to a huge refugee uh, crisis and many of their descendants still want to go back and settle, although they don't necessarily have the right to settle there. However, many, many Arabs still live in Israel to, even to this day, in particular in the northern region where they actually make up a majority still. However, from 1948 to 1966, the Israeli authorities put the Israeli Arabs under military rule. So the second class citizens within that state and they were seen as a fifth column. Yeah, they were seen as a potential threat and that's why they were kept under military rule. So this kind of gives like the backdrop of how the state of Israel was created. And I should also say as well that while 700,000 uh, Arabs were expelled from this land, we should also say that there was 260,000 uh, Jews uh, these were the Mizrahim Jews, and many of them lived in North Africa and in the Middle East. And during the first three years of Israel's existence, many of them were either forcibly expelled or they decided to flee because they were uh, suffering from persecution. And between 1948 and 1972, that number increased to 850,000, right? So you had 850,000 Jews fleeing from there. So you had the Nakba, 700,000, 
This is the Aliyah from the Arabic lands, and this represents 850,000. So within all of that mess, this is the kind of situation that they found themselves in around this time. Also, in 1956, Israel, along with Britain and France, attacked Egypt. And this was to do with the uh, Suez Crisis. So Nasser, the president of Egypt, uh, nationalised uh, the Suez Canal. And this was an attempt by the British, the French and the Israelis to take that territory back. So as a result of that, the UN sent their emergency forces. So this is the UNEF. And they were put on the uh, Egyptian side of the Egyptian-Israeli border to try and keep peace. And we should also say as well that throughout this whole time that Egypt had control over the Gaza Strip and the West Bank was controlled by Jordan. And the Jordanians did not allow any Jews within the West Bank or within the city of Jerusalem. So there's Jerusalem, no Jews, yeah, even though before there had been a majority. Now Jews were not able to enter and they weren't able to pray at the Western Wall. So from 1948 to 1967, no Jews were allowed in uh, Jerusalem. And yet still, in 1964, you have the setting up of the Palestine Liberation Organization. So this is the PLO, and their stated aim was not about trying to overthrow the occupation of the uh, Egyptians and the Jordanians, right? This is not trying to set up an uh, independent Palestinian state. This was about the destruction of the state of Israel, right? This is what it was founded upon. So three years before the, the occupation of the Gaza and the West Bank, this is when the organization was set up. So there was no real peace, there was no move towards peace during this time. And in 1966, Egypt and Syria signed a mutual defence pact. So just a bit of trivia with regard to this, uh, from 1958 to 1961, Egypt and Syria were one state, right? Uh, so they'd actually merged together as the United Arab Republic. Uh, so this fell apart, but still they were on very good terms with each other, right? So just a little bit of context with regard to that. And it's within this context that we have May of 1967. So May of 1967, the Soviets, who remember like they're in a Cold War with the Americans, right? So the Soviets during this time, they tended to back the Arabs more uh, because they saw Israel as being an ally of the US, even though America at this point wasn't really that involved. You don't tend to find that kind of like explicit kind of like really strong uh, support between Israel and America. This doesn't really come until uh, uh, the, the end of the Yom Kippur War. This is when America starts to uh, view Israel in, as like a strong ally. Before this period, they weren't really that involved, right? So it's kind of not really based on anything, but still the Soviets decided that they wanted to start a war between the Arabs and Israel, right? So it's for that reason that they gave a false report to the Egyptians that the Israelis were going to attack Syria. And so as a result of this, President Nasser decided that what he was going to do is he's going to close the Strait of Tehran. So this is in the southern part of Israel. This uh, stops uh, any kind of like outgoing trade uh, through this uh, strait. And then he decided that he was going to amass uh, troops along the Egyptian-Israeli border. He also signed a defensive pact with Jordan. So now Israel was surrounded. You had Egypt, Jordan and Syria all making pacts here yeah, towards each other. And on top of that, he also called for the withdrawal of all UN emergency forces from the border region. Now, Israel, we should say, never allowed these emergency forces to be there in the first place. But they saw all these uh, things as a clear sign as to what the intent of the Arabs was. And so they decided on the 5th of June 1967 to launch Operation Focus. This was going to be the preemptive attack of all of the Arab uh, armies which were surrounding them. So although there are numbers, so the Israelis just had 100,000 troops versus 240,000 Arabs, they end up defeating all of them. So, yeah, we call it the Six Day War, but realistically, this was pretty much like a three to four day war, right? Because when the attacks were launched on the 5th of June, they wiped out all of the uh, air forces of the different places. And then when they had aerial supremacy, they then went out about and de completely decimated the armies of the Arabs, right? So they destroyed Egyptian forces, Syrian forces, uh, Jordanian forces, Lebanese forces, Iraqi forces, and even Saudi forces as well, because there were some uh, foreign contingencies within these places, right? So all of these armies completely wiped out. You had a casualty ratio of 20 to 1, so you had 20,000 Arabs destroyed uh, versus uh, just 1,000 uh, Israelis. And on top of that, you had the seizure of the entirety of the Sinai Peninsula. You had the seizing of Gaza Strip, of West Bank, the Golan Heights, and also 
this is something as well. The Israelis were going to go into the east uh, side of the uh, Jordan River. So originally when the British founded uh, the mandate, they were going to have it as the mandate of Transjordan. So this all was going to be offered up to the uh, Jews as a homeland. But they only just settled with the west side of this. And it's because the Americans basically said, no, you're, you shouldn't uh, cross the, the Jordan River. So the Israelis thought, OK, we'll listen to you guys. We won't go into the Jordan River, even though we clearly could. Right. So you see all this territory here that you see on this map increasing the size of Israeli territory by almost five or six fold. And the only reason why the Israelis stopped is because the Israelis decided they wanted to stop. So on the 8th of June, you had uh, the Jordanians and the Egyptians uh, signing a, a ceasefire. On the 9th of June, you had the Syrians signing a, a ceasefire. And two days later, the Israelis kind of got a bit tired and was like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll sign the thing. That's the only reason why it was a six day war, not a three or four day war, right? So it's absolutely devastating, but we have to ask the question of what would have happened if they hadn't done this preemptive attack? What would have happened if they'd allowed the Arabs to mass their forces and eventually to invade Israel and to destroy Israel, which was the stated aim of President Nasser and the other Arab leaders? What would have happened? And that's what we're going to look into uh, here. So first of all, we're going to split up into four different sections, right? So we're going to have the effect on Israel. We're going to have the effect on Palestine. We're going to have the effect on the wider world. And we're going to have the effect of basically looking at none of these things would have happened, right? So all these things which have happened since 1967, which we know for a fact happened, all these things wouldn't have ever happened, right? So starting off with Israel, 